we're almost there up to this point. If we uh, select a row, it populates. We're seeing that to update a class, we're almost there. Now, the way PouchDB works is if you're trying to update a document, if you're up trying to update a record, you have to specify which underscore ID you're working with, and we've set the CRM as the unique identifier. So we've got that check. We've got an ID to work with to update the other, the other fields. We've got an ID to supply. So, back on our code, inside of the else section, which in this case we've used it now as the, as the non-error result, uh, what we're going to do is db.put. We've seen db.put before, at the very beginning, when we were actually saving our data for the first time. If we back up all the way up to line 59, in that case we were putting in a JSON object, an object that was formatted back over here as a variable and it's got the ID and all of that. So we bundle all of that information into one element right there. We can do the same thing here, but we're going to do it slightly differently because when we update a, a record, it, it also needs one extra piece of information in order for it to work, the revision ID. So I'm going to put the curly braces here. I'm going to, I'm going to create the JSON object at this point. I don't, we could create a variable to hold the JSON data, but I'll just do it at this point right here. And uh, it's valid for me to uh, break this uh, into multiple lines just for readability, but just be careful. Uh, to notice what you've done there. So we're, we need to sort of pass back in all of the data again, which was, what did we call these things? IDC class, is that what we called it? C name, C name, C inst, okay, so C name and C inst. Um, but this now requires a new field, underscore rev, revisions, or revision number. So the actual ID is pound update CRN, I mean dollar update CRN the particular CRN that we have uh, in mind. We have then whatever in the update class. We have whatever in update inst. And so all these have an, an ending comma because this is serial serialized data. Um, until the last one, rev. Rev comes from result dot underscore rev. And no final comma or anything. So the result object, the result object uh, has a uh, property of rev. So we need this. We need this field when we're making an update. There's no separate dot update. It's still dot put. Put something into the database. Now we're saying put a new revision, put a new version of the data into the database based on what is the current object just incremented by one. All that happens pretty internally, basically, but we need to provide this is our current object, one dash whatever. Now let's make two dash whatever. So we have to provide what is our current rev revision number so that it can increment it for us. Well, just like most things in pouch, any method has an anonymous callback to deal with success or failure. 
So comma, space. Right, what's the data we're putting in, comma, what's the result? Function, curly braces, error, or result. And you should see that this will be the same idea. Okay, if we've got an error, if we've got a result, then we should have an if-else statement to deal with that. So I will break those curly braces down here. Now before I do the if-else, I'm getting a lot of this going on right here. This is a common problem with callback functions. That's why now we have promises. Promises are supposed to be cleaner result from possible error, possible uh, positive result. You get this, what do we call this, um, pyramiding or something like that, that it looks like if you turn it sideways, it looks like the steps of a pyramid. Because when you get really complex with if-else, you've got all of this nested within, nested within, nested. So before I finish this right here, uh, maybe make some comments, because this is very easy to get lost. I'm going to say right here, and dot put a new data. This one up here is dot end of dot get dot get if else. And that's the end of our if else from get. And this one up here is dot end of dot get. that one, and that's the whole function, and function update class. So if you're just browsing your code, that makes no sense unless you follow back the, the connectors. But here with some comments, hopefully this makes sense. So our dot put ends right there, that's the end of our if else from dot get. That's the end of the whole dot get, and that's the end of that function. That's because we're we're going to have then an if else at this point. If we successfully put, that's a result. If there was some kind of failure, that's a result. Um, so if else. Make a note there, and of dot uh, end of dot put and uh, uh, dot put uh, function callback. That ends the if else from the callback of dot put. And the if is a result, else an error. I guess just to keep it in line with what we did previously here, an error. And then else. So if you got an error, put that into the console to try to figure it out. And then alert it to the user. Error. As for else, you can put that in the console if you want. That'll be a result. But more tangibly, redraw the table. We've changed the data. If we got to this level, this far deep here, it changed the data. Yes, it changed it. But it didn't change it on screen. Just like when we had the delete. We had db.remove or delete or whatever it is, and we deleted it internally, but it didn't delete it on screen. So we've got our function show. What do we call it? Show table? Show data? Show classes. Function show classes. 
questions show class levels. Redraw the table with the new data, with the new version of the names of the data and such. Let's, uh, let's save and run that. Let's see if that works. Uh, click your pencil on any of your rows of data, make a change, and we will see that there will actually be a little issue if you try to change the CRN, but we'll talk about that in a moment. But change any of the fields besides the CRN. Click the Update button. Hopefully your console looks good, and then on screen it also changes. Let's, let's check that. Fresh show. I misspelled English three, so I'll click there. It change it. Uh, it populates the field. I will write properly English. Click update class. On screen now it's English spelled properly, and then out here it says object OK true with revision number two. It's the second version of the data. Let's say, oops, it actually wasn't Instructor Alvarez, it was Instructor Sanchez. You go in and change, update that, Sanchez, and this is the third version of the data. The rest of this other stuff doesn't quite matter, but it's the third version. Now, yes, if I want, this is supposed to be class 123A. If I select that, and I say, this, this should be class 123A, try to update that. Warning, the CRN 123A does not exist. Exactly, it doesn't exist. I'm trying to change class 123A. There is no class 123A, there's 123. That's a different issue that we'll deal with in just a moment. But we need to provide these fields. Um, and here it's sort of like, I'm going to paint this floor. But I'm standing on the floor at a certain point, aren't I? So if I want to paint this square that I'm standing on, I need to move off of that square and paint that square. But now I'm on another square. That's what's happening here. You're trying to change something that doesn't exist. 123A doesn't exist. So technically what, what needs to happen here with more coding is create a new 123A with the existing class and instructor and then delete the old 123 and do that all internally without the user knowing that. That's what I had to do in the real world. I'm painting everything except that one square. So I have to step off of that square onto white paint and then paint some more, and then I painted it all. So internally it can be done with more, a little bit more coding. Uh, we may or may not do it, but that's what we would need to do. Create a brand new record with a brand new CRN to delete the old one, and then the user will never know, and it'll be a new cell in our data, but the user doesn't need to know. A couple of ways to handle this is, well, why would we let the user change, change that field? That's dangerous. One possible quick way to prevent the user from changing the CRN is to disable that field. Let the other fields here be editable, except for the CRN field. So we can add the uh, attribute when we <coughs> created on line 113, when we created the um, CRN uh, input type update CRN, we uh, could add also the attribute to disable it, which is simply disabled. Confirm that. Disabled. Yes. So if we add one more, it's simply disabled. It's not disabled equals true or anything. Disabled. If you go back to where we create the input field for field update CRN, we add the attribute just floating there, disabled. The point of that, this is one possible way to do this, not perfect solution yet, 
But the point of that is that once you click on any of these fields here, they're all editable except that one. So I can't edit it. That prevents the user from changing that. It doesn't prevent them from fixing their mistake, which is that should have been 123A from the beginning. Because that's going to require, again, save 123 temporarily, create a new 123A with the temporary data, delete the 123, populate it into this table, etc. So this might be a way to do it for the moment. Putting in that information, and that should have been uh, instructor. Um, Kamakura. I'll take that. So now it's a brand new instructor there. Should be instructor Jones with an S. Update that. Changes. I just saw my code here, and I thought of something to do a little change for. It shouldn't, it should still work, but I changed it, and it works just fine. But conceptually, maybe we should do this. A moment ago, I had, or we had, a dollar update CRN. That would work just fine, uh, but perhaps it's a little more correct to have it as result dot underscore ID. The reason is, remember when we were trying to delete the class previously? There was a point where we had said db.delete result, the actual object. So it worked by referencing what's in that field. But this could be another way to prevent them changing the, the CRN. Because by the time we get there, that's already stored in the result object. And we're just retrieving the ID property. That should work the same as before, just internally perhaps it's a little more correct. I'm changing this stuff, it should still change. That's revision 4 of my data. I have no limit to the revisions. Well, the limit of the size of the PouchDB object, which we saw in the documentation, depending on the browsers, like 5 to 25 to 50 megabytes per database per browser. Some of them have unlimited space like Chrome, so I can have unlimited number of revisions there. And since it's regular text, even at, at a simple like 5 megabyte database, that's still a lot of uh, revisions of data that I can save. Okay, we'll say um, one last thing while we work in, in this room. This is remembering everything that we're doing. When we come back, it forgets because of deep freeze. But if you're testing this on your own computers and such, the database is always there. There's a couple of ways to delete it. One is that um, in the application, we can select pouch by sequence. Don't do it this way yet. We could delete 
the data this way, but don't delete it this way. It's not it's not as good because this deletes the data, but the database sort of gets broken to some degree. We had early on created the function to initialize the database. Remember, early on we set ourselves up to be able to initialize the database. So by deleting the database from the browser, that's too much. That's that doesn't uh, then deal with uh, consequences. So we will set ourselves up to be able to delete the database from the app so that then we can reinitialize the database and, and properly work. There's at least uh, one use case that I've seen that if you try to delete the database from this point and then further try to save data, it won't work until you restart the web browser. So imagine if that was in the app, in an actual device. You'd have to force quit your app and all of that. So in the project, we'll make a mechanism to delete the database to then reinitialize the database to start again. So all of this data we've saved so far, we're about to lose it, but um, we have to break a few eggs to make a digital omelet. So uh, what we're going to do is uh, make, I guess, one more button, one more dynamically created button at the end of the, our code here, which will be to delete the database. Again, we can make this look nicer once we get it into our main project when we've got jQuery mobile. For the moment, we'll have a simple button to delete everything, and then internally it'll reinitialize the database. So we need to add furthermore to the string of that to make it appear at the end of everything. That's on line show classes right there. So at about line 115 string add some more to the string Do another horizontal rule. This time, just to make it stand out, three horizontal rulers, three lines, string, and create a button, same to lead database. Oh, delete classes, delete all classes. ID, call this PTN nuke, and totally nuke it. So this is a button to delete the whole database, all classes. <coughs> this one does not have any undos. It's a big scary button. We need to make an event handler so that it asks us to delete. We're going to put a little bit of safeguards. We'll get a pop-up that will ask, are you sure you want to delete the database? Then they can push push OK or cancel. If they click cancel, we go on our way. If they click OK, then it deletes it. So they have one chance to say, are you sure you want to do this? We can further put in more chances and even like password protected and all of that if we wanted. We'll have one level at least of, uh, of, of checking. Back to our code, we need to make an event handler for that button, so we'll back up to where we've got our block of event handlers. This is another dynamically generated button, so we will do the same thing again to the existing element of the div show on the event of a click. In this case, specifically the btn nuke, we'll call a function, function nuke. And that doesn't have to be anything that's special. We don't pass any extra parameters, so we don't need the anonymous function. So 
So to make that makes that dynamically generated button active, as we've seen before. We'll go then to the very end of our code after function update class, and the function definition of button nuke, button nuke function nuke. So there's several ways to have the the safety of, of making this ultimate decision. Um, one way is via a switch statement. We're going to make a pop-up happen, and there's the choice of proceed or cancel. So that's two possibilities there. That could be if-else, but we'll play with a switch statement. And what will happen under the switch is the condition that we're checking for is at this point we can run a confirm box. We can make a pop-up happen, which is a confirmation screen, a plain old JavaScript confirmation method. We'll have it say, you are about to delete everything. New line. Confirm. So the switch works with cases. Uh, we're going to have a case of true. Something will happen. That section breaks. There's the case of false. Something happens. That section breaks. If you didn't think of a possible case, there's the default case. Something happens, breaks, and ends. Now, uh, this is the, uh, a, co a confirmation either gives you a true or a false, but um, we could go based on what, <coughs> if we had like prompt, remember we had prompt, enter your name. Well, based on the text of that prompt, we could have different cases. It's just that in this case, we've got a true or false, but this could be many things. Like if we say type yes here to delete, well, that would be a case of yes, or else they type nothing or no or something wrong, well, it would be a different case. But in this case, it's simply a true. The true, um, the true type. In case of a true, that they saw the warning and they say you want to proceed, well, the true block will execute, that will finish, break, nothing else will happen after that. What will happen in the case of true, that they're confirming to delete everything, is db.destroy. So that would, that would attempt to destroy the database. This one doesn't take any particular argument because db is the argument. But, as usual, there is a callback function. And there could be an error attempted to destroy the database and a result of destroying the database. We'll break those curly braces, and then here we've got if else. There was either an error, or else there was no error. Display that in the console so we can try to figure something out, the error object, and then on screen, alert the user. If there was no error, then you can output that to the console to see what sort of result object we get back. 
um, at this case, if there was, if we get into the else, that means it did delete the database. So we want to do a couple of things here. We want to reinitialize the database. We want to reinitialize it so that the user can start to save data again. Well, we have init db that we created a while ago. Init db initializes the database. And we've got the we've got the um, L div show we've got the L div show element on screen. Well now there is a database that is empty ldiv show dot hide. There's nothing to show. Dot hide is a uh, dot dot hide is a is a uh, j jQuery method which hides an element. Maybe for fun we could also do this. We will chain in dot fade out. We'll see the database fade. I mean, we'll see this, the table fade away. You deleted it. It's going to fade away. You can put in a value here. You know, two thousand milliseconds. So it takes two seconds. When you're saying no, don't go away. But then it deletes in two seconds. All of that happens in the event of a true, that they read the warning, that they clicked OK, it got deleted. Well, there could be a, the, in the event of a false that the user uh, decides to not delete anything. Later on in jQuery Mobile, we'll make a nice jQuery Mobile style pop-up that says, you know, canceled. For the moment, uh, nothing really. We'll just we'll write to do add a jQuery mobile uh, pop-up later. So if they click cancel, nothing happens. The user gets no feedback, nothing happens. They cancel. <laughs> later on, we'll make a little animated pop-up appear that says, thank you for not deleting, or something. That's in the, in the case of false. There really should only be a true or false case with, with, uh, with confirm, the confirm method up here. But in case there's some other sort of unknown error under default, we will put in a console mod of uh, third error. Since there's only two options here, there's two possibilities. There probably won't ever be a default, but we'll, we might have to figure that out later. Let's see. I'm going to save that. I'm going to run it. Console. Whoops. Unexpected string. Line 44. What am I missing here? Line 44. What did I do back on line 44? Oh, in my case. Sorry about that. I wrote a period instead of a comma. No one pointed it out. Minus 10 points for everyone. So that should have been a comma, not a period. Good. Show classes. You got the scary delete all classes. Click that. Get the pop up. You are about to delete everything. Confirm. I got cold feet. Cancel. Nothing happens. Um, yeah, maybe put on the console there just to allay my fears. On the false, I'll put uh, user canceled. Maybe I should put something, some quick console output just to show myself. Delete all classes, con cancel that, right there, user cancel. So I am seeing something there. I'm going to take the plunge, I'm going to delete all my precious data here, delete all classes, click OK. OK, true. Didn't quite animate away like I thought it would, but 
goes object OK true. Show classes, nothing to show. Data is deleted. But that all disappeared. Wait a minute. Uh, here's the trick. Actually, it's backwards. You have to show it, then hide it. Save something. Save. Show classes. Uh, I'm going to choose to delete. So save that. Delete all classes. Click OK. There you go. Fading. Five seconds. Okay. So uh, it's kind of backwards. Uh, I had hide and then fade out in two seconds. You actually have to show it, even though it's already visible. You have to show it, but then you have to chain onto it, fade out two seconds. So you're going to see your div, and it's going to fade out in two seconds. Even though it's already shown, I guess because of the DOM tree or something, we have to have it shown explicitly, and then we can fade it out. Try that again. Um, save some classes. Show classes. I've got some classes to delete. Delete all classes. Confirm. OK. And it fades out in two seconds. opposite of what you were thinking. You show it first, then you fade it out. Or if you want to get fun here, because we're also doing, because um, it's all jQuery, you have built some basic built-in animations. Fade out, fade in. Um, there's this one too. Slide up. You can also put a time on that. So this is, we don't have jQuery, but we've got j... Uh, we don't have jQuery mobile, but we have jQuery. So... That might be another way to do it. I'm going to save some data, show class, select delete, click OK, slides up out of the way. Which I really like. Fade out, slide up, you can put some time increments. Alright, so at this point, um, we covered a lot. We further worked with this database specifically to delete elements, to update elements, to delete the whole database. You see what goes into play when we need to do it. When we look at someone else's app, it just works. You click delete, it deletes. We had to do all that prep, you know, update class prep. We still didn't fully do it as we might have envisioned it in that I want to change the CRN. We may do it later, but um, all of this that we need to do, we're up to 207 lines of code. It's pretty much all JavaScript from line 20 to 206, so almost 200 lines of just the JavaScript to get these four actions to work. There's still stuff that's missing. We haven't really sanitized our data input yet. We have some rough around the edges things here and there. I think it's pretty ugly the way we've got it that it shows all of this stuff. I'd like it to look nice in a nice, um, in a nice, oh, if we hide it, then we have to show it. But we, uh, this looks all weird. So with jQuery um, mobile, we'll be able to make that look nicer. I think I just saw something here from beta testing it. I've got data. I'm going to delete the database. I'll approve that. Okay, it goes away. I'm going to add new data to the database. I know I've reinitialized it. Save, show. It is showing it, but because we did dot fade out, the element has been 
hidden out of view. So that means I need to go back to the point where I first want to show the table and then do a show fade in or something. Let's see. Show table of classes. It's ultimately right here. So one more thing here. We've got our LDiv show that would display it if the element were shown. Now, if I refresh my code, it, it reinitializes it, but obviously I can't assume that someone will refresh. So LDiv dot show that will simply show it. Confirm. No fancy animation. Let me just confirm here. Add some data. Save it. Show it. Delete the whole thing. Add new data. Save it. Show it. Shows. Yeah. So just one more thing there. Because we had previously said hide that element. Well, it was it, it was hidden, but we never sh told it to show it again. And here now, after testing it more, oops, we've got to re-show it again. So show it if we wanted to animate it. This is where we have to do the opposite. This will just simply show it. If I wanted to animate, I have to first hide it, even though it's already hidden, and then I can do fade in with some amount of time. I'll make it obvious. Five seconds. We have to start with hidden. This is a long way. Save some data. Save it. Show it. Oh, fading in. quarter of a second. So it simply doesn't appear, fades in. And this works with jQuery. This is nothing special, extra, it's jQuery. jQuery has about six different animations built in, maybe less. And you can define your own. It's the dot animate method, which you need to go look up because to actually animate it's rather complex. But we can animate any properties that have numeric values. So we can animate rotation and movement and all of this cool stuff. Uh, opacity. Here at the very least, we get a little animation of a quick quarter of a second whenever I save anything and show it. Very subtle. Delete everything. Confirm. Takes a few seconds. Bye bye data. And then again, save and show. All right. Uh, if I find before I find any more things, I'll end at this point, and um, we'll uh, have a little lab time. When we come back next time, we'll start to incorporate this into the project. This works on its own. We're testing it here on its own. We're going to incorporate this into our into our project, the MySDCE project. That's the whole point. The user will save these classes, you know, records of their classes and such, and uh, we are then retrieving it in the in the app. So I'm going to put my code in the network folder. If you want to copy. So if you look in the network folder, you'll see patch db start victor uh, November 1st. These videos, remember to send another email for the latest versions of the videos. There's a couple of people I haven't replied about my videos from last time, sorry. I'll get back to you very soon. This is a new playlist of videos, and I'll send those out to you if you request them. So see you Thursday.